Good morning, everyone. I am very excited to have uh, you guys online as we live stream today's presentation. My name is Melissa Walker and I am the director of the TRIO Training Academy at Penn State University. Uh, the TRIO Training Academy was created to provide professional development based on grant funded programming that we do for the TRIO community who are uh, specific types of grants that work with low income first generation students. However, we really wanted to advocate for all communities. And in doing so, one of the things that we wanted to do was reach this particular audience in order to have a truly representative, um, well, to truly represent the community in a way that really hasn't been done uh, so much in the past. Uh, so this conference is 100% about autistic voices uh, and will be, facilitated uh, entirely by uh, autistic speakers and representatives and advocates. So with that being said, I want to take a moment to uh, introduce the team. There's several people working with us today uh, in the background, and that includes myself. Uh, there's also Kara Dwyer, who is the Education Program Coordinator for the TRIO Training Academy, and she is going to be doing uh, a lot of the background moderations and things like that as far as making sure chat is handled and that questions are being asked um, and really just doing a lot of the, um, the very intensive work that she is very appreciated for. Uh, Jessica Petrie is also one of our facilitators as far as working in the background to moderate and help with anything that might need to be done. And then we have Topher Yorks, who has been uh, just a fantastic addition to this particular team, doing and providing expert um, producing in order to make sure that this works directly through the live streaming services, that we are coordinating everything that we have available uh, as far as all of the different things that you see happening today. You will be able to see multiple ways to participate in with this conference. So there is a chat box there available for you to ask questions, to comment, to, you know, if you'd like to, you know, comment on something someone else asked, any of those types of things that's available there. Um, there is also live captioning, so feel free to open that up so that you can enjoy uh, the ability to read what is happening uh, and also have that, um, if you have voice captioning that comes along with it or anything like that, it's available. Uh, we also have ASL available for us in this particular conference, understanding that ASL is truly an American thing. However, uh, this is what we are providing today. And I appreciate all of you that, um, especially our interpreters who are using not only their, their expertise, but you know, also the spoons that are required in order to uh, you know, manage a full day of interpretation uh, as they you know, tag team off throughout the day. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or any member of the team. You can reach me directly uh, at mwalker at psu.edu. If you have any comments or concerns, please feel free to reach out to me directly as well. I am happy to do whatever we can in order to make sure that this is successful and meaningful to you. One of the final things I would also like to remind you of is that each particular session is going to have a transition period with a break in between. These transition periods will be marked with um, a, you know, a countdown timer. It will, there will be a screen that comes up that says that we are in break. Uh, so please feel free to you know, come back to our presentations at any point, but we are definitely here for anything that you may need in the meantime. If you have any questions about any of those things, again, please feel free to reach out. Again, email mwalker at psu.edu. I am very excited to introduce Erin Finley, who is going to be starting off our presentation. And I'm just going to transition directly over to her because who wants to hear any more about all the logistics of Zoom this morning? <laughs> Let's get to the fun stuff. So I hope you guys enjoy the conference. And um, I'm really looking forward to all the speakers myself. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dr. Erin Findlay, and I'm proud to be here in assisting the conference today. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right, so my presentation this morning is kind of giving you an orientation and an overview 
for autism from the inside out. Um, <clears throat> so this is kind of our roadmap for today. So I'm going to do some acknowledgements, introduce myself, talk a little bit about the accommodations from a functional standpoint um, and give you some useful terminology. Then we'll go into the pathology paradigm, which is the, the uh, paradigm that has been used to identify autistics for most of history. Um, then we're gonna shift to the neurodiversity paradigm where we, uh, many of us operate from now, which is um, the paradigm that, that really includes autism as a neurotype and as a brain style, rather than as a dysfunction. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about what autism is like from the inside. And then hopefully we'll have enough time for Q and A at the end. Um, we also may have a photo bomb from my cat. So just if you see a tail, that's what that is. Okay, so the first thing I wanna do is acknowledge that I am bringing you this presentation from the unceded lands of the Mayakama Onastas or Southern Wapo tribe and the Winton Patwin tribes. So these are the Native American tribes that are in the, in the area that I live, which is Napa, California. And I wanna acknowledge that I am coming from their lands today. So again, my name is Dr. Erin Findlay. I'm a psychologist. Um, in addition to that, I am white, autistic. I'm an adhd -er, gifted, cast plus, flux, cis female. Um, so my pronouns are she and her, and I'm bisexual, heteroromantic. So those are some identities that I bring in with me today. And I, I mentioned that because there's a lot of identity um, intersection with autistic people, um, particularly around gender and sexual orientation. So I wanna highlight that for you. In terms of knowledge um, that I bring to you today, I am a licensed clinical psychologist. I work in private practice. I do brain spotting. I'm a certified consultant and therapist. Um, brain spotting is a trauma treatment. I also do emotionally focused therapy for couples and I particularly enjoy mixed neurotype couples. So why not be autistic? One might be allistic, which is not autistic. Um, I work a lot with trauma, neurodiversity. Um, I do psychological assessment and I also do performance psychology. So we've talked a little bit already, Melissa's talked a little bit already about the accommodations that are um, being offered in the conference as a whole today. And I want to address just a little bit the um, accommodations that I'm personally providing in my segment. So in my presentation, I've used muted colors and um, a clean design. So I wanna make sure that I am not sensory overloading anybody, particularly visually. Um, also, I'm aware that attention differences might be impacted, so um, using the design to try to bring in attention and um, not overload people on a sensory level, but also not use too many words for those who have um, reading disabilities. Um, we are also including closed captioning as being discussed. There's a recording and a transcript that will be available after the session. I will also make my slides available after the session for those who need more time for processing. Um, because this is a live stream with a large audience, of course, we're not having any participants on video. But if we were doing this in a smaller group, I would allow participants to have the option to turn video on or off, depending on what they needed for their own sensory needs. Um, also, the chat function being open for feedback and questions is an opportunity for people to communicate in a different way, um, allow processing speed differences. Uh, if a person has speech dyspraxia or anxiety uh, performance, um, you know, any of those things, uh, we're going to, you know, the chat function is, is a great tool to use if you would like to communicate, but um, again, not vocally. And then um, I'm gonna include a stretch break. It might not be exactly at 30 minutes, but, um, but I will include a stretch, stretch break for those people who need to just wiggle their bodies a little bit. 
I'm also using signposting. I didn't actually mention that, but signposting is uh, giving a heads up before we make a transition so that folks can be a little bit more prepared for the transition. And this is particularly useful for autistic people. One of the things that you'll notice today in my presentation is that I refer to autistic people instead of people with autism. So autistic people is identity first language, and that's strongly preferred by the autistic community. Person first language, person with autism, so you're listing the person first, was originally introduced for the purpose of trying to emphasize the humanity of the person being discussed, but unfortunately it actually has the opposite effect. Um, it tends to increase stigma rather than decrease stigma. So I'm gonna use identity first language in my presentation. Another thing that's important to, um, to understand here is that there's a difference between neurotypical and allistic. And this is one of my little pet peeves, so you get to hear about it today. Um, neurotypical means anybody who fits the sort of way society expects your brain to function. Allistic is the opposite of autistic. So there are allistics who are neurodivergent, but there are no neurotypicals who are not allistic. In other words, um, allistic and autistic are opposites, neurotypical and neurodivergent are opposites. Okay, so we're at our next touch point. Um, so we're gonna move on now to talking about the pathology paradigm. The pathology paradigm is, is rooted in the medical model and it's rooted in the idea of people being um, sort of measured from their distance from the baseline. So if you are expected to be able to do A and you can't do A, you're looked at as being deficient or broken. Um, so uh, I've, just, uh, I've just gotten a heads up that the captioner had an emergency and we're not able to do the first session. So the captions will be not be available for me, um, but I do wanna let you know that the captions will be available for the rest of the conference and in the recording, the captions will be available. So I apologize for that inconvenience. Um, so, so anyways, going back to the pathology paradigm, the idea of the pathology paradigm is that, you know, that there's a person who should be sort of measuring up to a certain standard that's, you know, some based on some statistical average, right? It's not a, um, it's not a real person, right? The neurotypical is actually not a real thing because there's nobody in the world who's 100% perfectly statistically neurotypical. Um, but but the medical model uses this pathology paradigm as a way of um, getting people back into the range of quote unquote normal. The problem is that it doesn't allow room for differences. Um, so the, just a brief history here on the, um, the development of autism as a diagnosis. And, and I wanna back up a little bit and say that autism, autism was identified first by, and, and named first by people observing from the outside and making assumptions and drawing conclusions based on what they were seeing from the outside, not understanding what was going on on the inside of the person. Um, and so these, these papers that were written first in 1926 by Brunia Sugareva, and then 1943 by Leo Kanner, which was kind of one of the, the very first people to have um, publication about autism that, that reached a wide audience. Um, and, and then 
Hans Osberger, who was um, who was later than that, but he um, his his work sort of fell into obscurity for a while. Um, these these folks were all observing and trying to figure out how how the how autistic people were different from normal and they were attempting to um to understand based on their own worldview and they didn't understand that um that autistic people our brains function quite differently from allistic people so the original set of ideas was that autistic people weren't interested in social contact, that autistic people were lost in our own worlds, that we weren't even full humans, um, sadly. Um, and the idea was, in terms of uh, treatment, became um, became focused on getting autistic people to mimic allistic people in terms of behavior, um, largely for the comfort of the people around them. Uh, so, so that was the purpose of the uh, clinic that um, Lovas established in 1962. In, in, in 1944, I should also mention, mention Hans Osberger, um, his work got, um, pushed a little bit into obscurity because of the, um, the Nazi regime. And um, Lorna Wing in 1976 brought his work out again and brought it back into the light. Um, unfortunately, she didn't bring out the information about him also being a Nazi, which is why one of the reasons why Asperger's syndrome is no longer um, part of the diagnostic criteria. So, um, so Lorna Wing published her work in 1976. And then in 1980, the, the sort of diagnostic Bible for uh, mental health disorders, the DSM was, uh, published the third edition and the idea of autism was included for the first time. So it was revised in 1987 when they realized the criteria were not um, sufficient. But again, these criteria were built on outside observations, lack of understanding from the inside out and, um, and also based on seeing autistic people in distress. So the criteria kept shifting over the years, but the criteria still to this day are based on what does an autistic person who is distressed look like, not what does an autistic person look like from the inside out. Um, that's one of the reasons this conference is so important because we are giving you an opportunity to see inside of our heads and understand from our own perspectives. Um, treatment, treatment for autism has historically been rooted in the pathology paradigm. And that results in autistic masking. And when we mask our mental health and our physical health deteriorate, because this, the load on our mental uh, faculties is so high to try to not only manage the sensory inputs that we have, but also the, um, the demands of like trying to check and match and see, are we actually, um, fitting the expectations that are supposed to be met here. Um, it, it increases the load on us so much that our physical and mental health deteriorate. Okay, so here are some myths and stereotypes, and this is not at all exhaustive, 
but it's an idea that gives you a sense of some of the ways that that autistic people are assumed to be but really aren't necessarily so the first one is eye contact and and even psychological assessors will say oh well you can't be autistic you can make eye contact and what they don't those what those people and particularly psychological assessors don't realize is we can make ourselves make eye contact sometimes it feels like you know staring into a vat of acid but we can make ourselves do it and some of us many of us have been trained to do that so we're having to override that discomfort and there's actually brain studies that show the differences in how threat is registered when autistic people make eye contact in an allistic way um, versus responding to our own needs so you you might yeah, this is harder to tell over Zoom, but but if I'm talking to someone, I'm usually looking somewhere else. I'll check in, I'll look, but I'm not going to necessarily stay staring at their face because that doesn't work for me. Or if I do, I'm staring here in between their eyes, not actually at their eyes because my nervous system goes into overload and I'm actually looking at their eyes. Another myth is that autistics aren't interested in social contact or relationships. And that is such a bunch of baloney. <laughs> um, we are as social as any other human. And there are variations in humans. So some people are more social, some people are less social. Um, but the vast majority of us want to be in social relationships, but our ways of relating can be different. And our ways of relating can be um, difficult to understand for people who aren't autistic. Um, so it takes time to unpack and figure out how do I communicate? How do you communicate? How do we communicate together? I can't tell you how many times I'm, I'm married to a man I can't tell you how many times I'll say something quite literally to my husband because I speak in a very literal way as many autistic people do. And he'll read meaning into what I say rather than um, actually taking you know, what I say literally. So I'll give you a quick example. This is kind of a funny story. Um, when we were first married, we had something in the, in the trash can in the garage. I don't even remember what at this point, but I remember both of us standing out in the garage because we were doing some laundry or something. And, and he said, oh, it really stinks in here. And I said, yeah, it's because we haven't taken the trash out. And he starts walking over to the trash can to pick up the trash and take it out. And I said, what are you doing? He said, well, you just asked me to take out the trash. And I said, what? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> I, and so I was observing a fact and he assumed that I had meaning in that, um, that I didn't mean. And this happens all the time. It's called the double empathy problem. I think it's gonna be discussed by other presenters in more depth, but I want you to be aware of this. That, like there's this communication gap that happens all the time. And it's not that we're not interested in social contact or relationships, but it's difficult because we're really talking about cross-cultural relationships between autistics and allistics, and those are hard. Another um, myth and stereotype is that most autistics are male, like way more male than female. First of all, um, autistics tend to be much less ad adherent to the gender binary than uh, allistics are. So there are uh, many more trans people and agender and gender fluid, gender queer. Um, I'm cast flux, which means that I, I do identify as the biological sex that I was born into, but I also find that to be varying levels of importance. So sometimes my my femaleness is very important to me. And sometimes it like is totally irrelevant. So that's me, um, but there's a variety, a much wider variety of um, gender presentations for autistic people. And again, this is a very important thing to be thinking about. 
another uh, another myth that's important to break here is the idea that autism is equated with intellectual disability. Now, this was based on early outside in assumptions of autism. But again, if it's it, once you understand that there's this cultural difference, this double empathy problem that impacts allistic and autistic communication and that intellectual abilities are assessed from an allistic point of view, then autistic people often show up as intellectually disabled when that's actually not true. Um, so it's very, very important to presume competence at all times when you're working with an autistic person. Um, and, and assume that the problem is more likely rooted in communication differences and cultural differences and brain style differences rather than lack of ability on the autistic person's side. Another um, issue is, or stereotype is autism equals savant skills. So there are autistic people who are savants and that's awesome, but they are not uh, any more common than savants who are allistic. And so one of the things that happens though, is we do have our special interests or spins um, and we can focus in very deeply. So sometimes it looks like we have a savant skill when the reality is we've just spent a lot of time practicing that thing or learning about it or exploring it. And so we have this amazing ability, um, but it's built the same way any other person builds ability with it, which is dedication and practice. Another myth is that vaccines cause autism. Um, this is based on a, an assumption or an, not an assumption, a uh, fraudulent is the correct word, a, a fraudulent uh, paper that was published um, linking vaccines and autism. The paper that actually published that um, has since been retracted, um, but the damage remains that the idea that somehow vaccines cause or increase autism. Now, there is also a piece where many autistic pe people also experience health difficulties and health difficulties are often associated with vaccine injury, but that's different than vaccines causing autism, okay? Another myth is that cold or unfeeling parenting causes autism. Again, it's not that cold or unfeeling parenting causes autism. Cold and unfeeling parenting causes trauma. And if you're autistic, and you have a cold and unfeeling parent, you will react more. So you might appear more visibly autistic, but the autism was already there and the trauma made it visible to the people who are looking for signs of a traumatized autistic person. Um, another, another myth is that diet lifestyle choices or anything like that can cure autism. Autism is a neurotype. It's, it's like me having brown hair or green eyes. I mean, okay, if I had brown hair and I wanted to have red hair, I could dye it. Yeah, that's true. But that wouldn't make it grow out of my head red. It would just make my external appearance red, right? Um, so, so we have a brain style. We have a way that our brains function and that, that doesn't change on a fundamental level um, through diet or other lifestyle choices. Now, again, many autistic people experience GI issues, gastrointestinal issues. Um, and so if a person is having problems with their digestive tract and they shift their diet so their digestive tract is healthier, 
then they're going to be a less traumatized, less activated autistic person, but they will still be autistic. They just won't be showing the signs that you would look for from the pathology paradigm. So this is, it's a nuance, but it's a really, really important nuance that, that like we're autistic regardless, but as long as you're gauging from the pathology paradigm and you're looking for signs of autistic distress and autistic trauma, then it might look like autism is cured when in fact, what's happening is you're looking at a person who's autistic and less distressed. Um, and the last myth that I have listed here is that there's an autism epidemic. And again, this is a really important thing to be, um, to be emphasizing, um, that this is a myth. Autistic people have always been here. We will always be here. We are part of the natural ways that humans develop. And the reason there are more people who are being identified as autistic now as, as compared to before is because we know more about autism and we know how to identify autistic people better and better and better. And we know how to identify autistic people who are less distressed. So Yes, more people are being identified as autistic, but that doesn't mean there more people are autistic. Okay. I'm pause here for a little bit of water. Okay. So some of you might recognize this clip. Um, some autistics do look like this, but most of us don't. Sometimes white comes down Stop it. Good morning. Coffee? Yes, every good. Sally Dips Dips Sally. 461-0192. How did you know my phone number? How'd you know that? You said read the telephone book last night. Dib Sally, 4610192. He uh, remembers things, little things sometimes. Very clever, boys. I'll be right back. How'd you do that? How'd you do that? I don't know. You memorize the whole book? No. You start from the beginning? Yeah. How far'd you get? G. G? G, God sake, William Marsh, God sake. You memorized to G? Yeah, G. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. G. Half a G. That's good, Ray. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, that's from the movie Rain Man, starring Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise. And there are some autistic people who look like that, but if that's your definition of autistic, then you're going to miss an autistic who looks like me. I have a performance background. I've been studying human relationships as one of my special interests since I was a kid. Um, there are still times that I get tripped up, but, but you're gonna miss somebody who looks like me, who presents like me, if you're thinking that that's what autistic looks like and that's only how autistic looks. Okay, so we have a quick question in the chat. Um, how can we identify, uh, how can we advocate for identity first language in higher education classrooms? Many professors still require person first language. And uh, Chloe, thank you for asking that question. That's a great question. Um, the best thing to do is to uh, show them, there are some recent articles and I'll include this in my follow-up materials. There are some recent research articles on the preferences of the autistic community and even the, um, the American Psychological Association in their seventh edition of um, the style guide um, has, has highlighted the need for 
shifting to whatever the community in question prefers. So the best thing to do is to show the, the evidence to the professors that, that person first language increases stigma rather than decreasing it. So it doesn't actually achieve its goal, um, that it's not preferred by the autistic community. And also that um, the style guides are changing to include um, prioritizing the preferences, the stated preferences of the communities in question. Great question, thank you very much. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the neurodiversity paradigm for a bit. So this is an introduction to neurodiversity and just, it's lovely, so just enjoy. Our world is home to an extraordinarily beautiful variety of life. According to Sir David Attenborough, the term biodiversity describes the total variety of life on Earth. Thousands of different wild habitats, millions of different species, and billions of different individuals with trillions of different characteristics. This biodiversity is not only the most complex aspect of our planet, but also the most vital. As humans, we are not separate from biodiversity. We are part of biodiversity. Just as planet Earth requires ecosystem diversity, species diversity, and genetic diversity in order to maintain balance and thrive as a whole, so too do humans, as a species, require diversity not only to survive, but to flourish. Across history, there has been a tendency for human beings to fear our differences, to equate difference with defectiveness, or even label our differences as disorders. We think that it is time for us to rethink the way we view our differences. We think that it is time for us to recognize that difference represents diversity, and this diversity is vital to our collective well-being. The more genetic diversity there is among us, the better we are able to continually adapt to our environment as it changes and evolves. Species that lack genetic diversity are far more vulnerable to being devastated by changes in the environment. This means, as a species, we do not survive despite people who are different, but rather, the differences among us are the diversity that helps humanity to flourish. There are many obvious ways in which we humans differ from one another. But perhaps less obviously, we all differ in the way our minds work. Humans think, feel, perceive, process, and experience the world in vastly different ways. This beautiful diversity of human minds with infinite variation in traits and abilities is known as neurodiversity. There are minds that sense the most subtle changes in the environment. Minds that have a determined sense of social justice. And minds that create stories within worlds that most of us can only read about. There are minds that seek patterns to process and synthesize. There are minds that crave words or numbers or images. There are busy minds and quiet minds, highly focused minds and distractible minds. There are minds that think deeply and feel intensely. When we value neurodiversity as a form of genetic diversity, as part of the biodiversity of planet Earth, we start to value our differences and see they do not require curing, treating, or masking. We see that our differences can be accepted, appreciated, and respected. We start to support each other to find a place in this world and flourish as individuals while increasing the resilience of humanity as a whole. So just as a quick fun exercise, I want you to imagine a horse. Picture it in your mind how, or, or imagine it in whatever way your mind naturally gravitates to. Picture that horse in a field. And I want you to look at the image in your mind. Is it 
fully detailed like a movie? Does it move? Does it have color? Is it like a snapshot? Is it still static? Is it dark? Is it clear? Is it black? Do you see anything at all? And I want you to just put into the chat what you notice about your own internal visualization of this horse. What are the characteristics that you notice about how you visualize? And Kira, if you could just put a couple of answers into my chat for me. So I'm gonna take another moment. So many people have some sort of visual imagery that's called uh, their ability to um, uh, fantasia and aphantasia. Aphantasia is the inability to visualize images and their, and hyperphantasia is the uh, extreme end of detail, motion, color, sensory. Um, so, so a couple of the responses are starting to come in. Like one person says, I can't visualize. It's a picture of the last horse I saw. My, another person says, my image was static with very few details. Another person says, my image was, uh, or it's running, main flying, sunny day a sense of freedom. Another person says moving with bright vivid colors. Another person says my horse is incomplete. So here's one very simple, many different flashes of a horse. That's another one, great. And so there are, <laughs> someone's imagining a unicorn. Whoever you are, you're my kind of person because I am a unicorn gal, um, I have a collection. Um, one of my special interests. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, there's a spectrum of aphantasia through dysphantasia to just regular old fantasia to hyperphantasia. So aphantasia is you can't visualize anything at all internally. You might have a conceptual idea of a horse, but you don't see the horse in your mind. Dysphantasia is... Um, when when the image is vivid or is incomplete or it's uh, dimmed out, um, then regular Fantasia it's usually um, you know a full picture, and then hyper Fantasia is like you're in 3D surround sound, the whole nine yards. So just in this one way, you can see how different our brains are how different our minds work. And this is just one small aspect, right? So, so this is neurodiversity right here, right? And, and none of us are wrong. None of us are bad because, you know, I see a partial picture of a horse and you see a, you know, a full movie 3D version. And another person sees a realistic drawing of a horse like in a textbook. N none of our brains are wrong. Our brains are all correct for our brains, right? But if we're going from a pathology paradigm, then the person who sees very little or nothing at all is seen as dysfunctional or lacking in some way. 
and in need of repair. So this is the value of the neurodiversity paradigm. Our Oops. world is home to an extraordinary... And apparently I just tried to replay the video. I do like it. Um, all right, so which leads us directly into different models of disability. So if you're measuring a person based on a lack of something and you're saying that their impairment is the problem, you're operating from a medical model of disability. So that model is, the, the problem is located in the person. So to use our, um, our aphantasia experiment, somebody who could, can't visualize, create a, an actual picture in their mind would be seen as disabled. And the problem is located in them and the focus would be on either preventing aphantasia or treating it somehow to like make them start to visualize, although I can't even imagine how you would go about that, try to cure that in some way. But again, that disregards the value of the diversity. The functional model of disability is based on how a person functions or doesn't in a specific arena. So. Um, so again, if, if you're measuring against, uh, you know, a person should be able to see a picture of a horse in their mind and they can't, then they would say there's a functional disability. Um, so it's, it's a little bit less stigmatizing than the medical model, but it does, it does look at the functions and, um, and, you know, measures against a standard. And then there's the social model of disability where the problem is located in the environment around the person. And the focus is on adjusting the environment to adapt to the person. So in the case of the, um, the comic strip here, um, this environment is not facilitating the person in the wheelchair. That person needs ramp, right? So the social mo model of disability says, build a ramp so that a person in a wheelchair can come in, right? The medical model of disability is, you know, let's get that person walking. Let's, you know, they, they, have, a, they have a functional disability. Their legs don't work or don't work as needed um, in order to be able to walk upstairs. And the impairment is the problem. They should be able to walk upstairs. So that person needs to be cured. So you can understand, you hopefully start to see and understand how, where the, lo the problem is located um, can either add um, opportunity or detract opportunity. If we're looking at a social model of disability and we respond by adjusting the environment, more people get included. Right. But if we're going from a medical model of disability, then we're looking at how do we fix somebody who's broken? But what if you're not broken? What if you're just different, right? Brown hair isn't broken, but, but if, if the, the world at large said, no, you should have red hair instead, then I would be considered broken. I'd have to dye my hair in order to be okay. So this is, this is the different models of disability and the social model of disability is very much tied to neurodiversity. Okay. Let's take a pause for a stretch break. It's about time. Um, so it's 7.49 a.m. my time. So let's just pause and stretch a little bit. And at 7.51 my time, we'll come back. Just move your body a little bit. I'm gonna pet my cat. Um, if there are any questions, I can also take a question or two right now. Oh, 
shoulders. Okay, so a question from the chat, thinking about the autism levels, can we say that distress levels correlate to these levels? No. Um, and I'll talk about functioning levels in a little bit, um, but there's, there's more to it than that. Um, and also functioning levels and functioning labels are, um, are problematic. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, another question from the chat. Um, when does working with the pathology paradigm make sense for helping autistic people, as in treating anxiety disorders, for example? I'm not sure it ever does um, because there's, um, like when I'm thinking about anxiety disorders, yes, I wanna know what's making the person anxious, but my thinking is also about what's their environment like, who's being supported, um, you know, what, uh, what sensory inputs are they receiving that they might or might not be able to be managed. So there's, um, I, I tend to not subscribe to the pathology paradigm um, much at all. Um, I, I would be more inclined towards the, the social model um, with the functional model because there is, a, there is a reality to the functioning model, right? Um, if a person has a reading disability to the point where they can't take in words with their eyeballs, then that person does have a functional impairment and they need accommodations. Absolutely, right? And, and this is not to say that, um, you know, life is perfect all the time for autistic people, it's not. Um, but it does mean, um, sorry, lost my train of thought, hold on. The, The functioning model of disability is more neutral than the pathology-based model because the pathology-based model often includes value judgments um, and, and puts value judgments on what is or isn't normal, um, but then treats those value judgments as if they're facts rather than um, what's the word? So this is me being autistic right here. I think in concepts and in order for me to uh, some translate into verbal language, I have to slow down and let that be. Um, so, So the functioning model allows, you know, gives, gives a sense of what a person is, can and cannot do, right? And it's, it's not, you know, uh, difficult to say, or it's, it's not pathologizing to say that a person who doesn't have functional legs can't walk, right? That's a statement of fact. Um, but the pathology model is um, the, the and the medical model of disability is goes takes it to a step further and says and says that that's bad and that that's sort of um, somehow a flaw in the person. So there's a value judgment that gets built in to the medical model of disability that isn't present with the functional model or the social model. So I, 
I don't, I don't know that I would ever say that the, the, the pathology paradigm has a lot of value. Um, another question from the chat is, um, isn't there no right or wrong with identity first versus person first language? It's a matter of preference. Shouldn't we ask the person how they prefer to be called? Similar to how we ask for pronouns or if people want to be called by a first name, last name, et cetera. So, so the short, no, I have to give you the long answer. The long answer is um, it depends on who you're talking about. So if you're talking to a specific person and that person, oh, sorry about the dogs, um, and that person has um, a specific stated preference, like they want person first language, then it's very important to honor how that person identifies. Okay, so you're absolutely right that it's, it's crucial to honor how an individual person identifies. But when you're talking about a group and that group has a stated preference, then it's important to talk about, to use the uh, method that is preferred by the group when talking about the group. So if I had a friend who prefers person first language with autism. So they want to be, they, they identify as a person with autism. Um, then I would refer to that person as a person with autism. And I would probably make a parenthetical note that that's their preferred language or that's how they identify. Um, but when talking about the autistic community as a whole I would still use identity first language because identity first language has been identified as the group preference. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, another question from the chat, is the autistic label harmful for us by itself? Labels can be useful and they can be stigmatizing. Um, I don't, personally see the autistic label as harmful for us by itself. Um, that doesn't mean that people don't experience harm because of the label, but the, the thing that causes the harm is uh, the ableism of the people who are using that label in a stigmatizing way. So ableism is, is on a very, very broad level, the idea that a person should be able to do something, whatever it is, like I should be able to, um, I don't know, make a layup in basketball. Um, even though I'm five foot two and I will never, you know, play in the NBA, um, right? So, so it's ableist to say, I should be able to do X. Um, you know, it, it, think about it from a perspective of you're, you know, sick one day, right? And you have the dialogue in your head of like, I should go to work. I should be able to get up and push through this, right? That's ableism on a, on a micro level, but it's still ableism. So um, the, the label itself is not harmful, it's ableism and how the label gets used in an ableist way that's harmful. Okay, we're gonna pause on questions for a moment so that I can keep going. Um, Self-identification versus medical diagnosis. This is another really important thing that's based in the neurodiversity paradigm. Self-identification is valid. If you're looking at how your brain works from the inside out and you're comparing it to how other autistic people's brains work and you're like, yeah, mine works more like yours than these other people's, you've self-identified. Congratulations, welcome to the club. Um, that is completely, totally valid because there's no way for me to plug in a USB into your head and like read out what's happening inside of your life and your experience. Um, so, so if your sense of yourself is that you're autistic, you're autistic. Medical diagnosis is different, okay? Medical diagnosis 
is when you actually go through the procedure and it's different in different areas of the world, different states in the United States. Um, but there's usually some sort of assessment procedure to be able to identify whether or not you meet the medical diagnosis and the medical diagnostic qualifications for autism. Um, the tricky part is <laughs> those diagnostic criteria are based on outside in observations of autistic people who are in distress, okay? So, and a, a subset of autistic people who are in distress, namely white boys. Um, so if you don't match, that doesn't mean you're not autistic. It might mean that the diagnostician can't identify you accurately because of their level of competency. Um, so, Medical diagnosis is unfortunately required to access supports. Um, so if you want or need supports to function and um, you need to have assistance paying for that because um, you know those things are not cheap, um, then those that you would need a, the medical diagnosis for that. It's tricky to get medical diagnosis though because Diagnosticians, even the bad ones, are in high demand. You know, most of my colleagues who do neurodiversity affirmative assessment have a six month minimum wait list. Um, and it's distressing to us because we know that it's really, really needed to have capable, competent diagnosticians. But, um, but we also know that we can only do so much in a given day. Um, the competency, like I mentioned earlier, the competency of those diagnosticians varies dramatically. So there are some people even now who, um, psychological assessors who will say, you can't be autistic if you make eye contact. That person I would say is not actually competent in diagnosing autism. They're only competent in diagnosing a very small subset of autism. Um, so the competency of the diagnostician varies. Um, and diagnosis can also be cost prohibitive. If you're lucky, your insurance, your health insurance will cover it. But most people are not so lucky, um, especially adults. And because autism wasn't introduced as a, a diagnosable thing until 1980, there are a lot of people who are adults, you know, middle-aged and L older who don't have a diagnosis because it, it diagnostically wasn't a thing when they were younger. Um, and of course the knowledge about autism was less, um, uh, less uh, comprehensive. So um, if you're an adult, it's harder to get a diagnosis. Um, but not impossible, but it can be cost prohibitive. Um, and then there's also the other very factors that, that make it difficult to get diagnosis, such as um, you know, being uh, from a marginalized group or multiple marginalized groups, such as um, race or gender variant or um, LGBTQ, um, you know, all of those intersecting identities, um, the, the more those identities intersect, the harder it is to access diagnosis and to get the diagnosis that you need. So th there are real, real barriers here. And it's something, um, one of the groups that I've formed is the a neurodiversity, um, affirmative psychological assessors. And the, the hope is to create um, more knowledge about how to do effective, um, you know, reasonable cost assessment for autistic people to help the medical diagnosis log jam get unjammed. So, okay. So, We've talked a lot about autism, but I haven't actually told you what it is. How about I do that? 
what is autism? And this is derived from the definition by Nick Walker, PhD. Nick is an amazing, amazing scholar. She is uh, just brilliant. Um, and I highly recommend that you go and read her uh, description on her website, which is listed right there, um, to get a very clear, but much longer than I have time for, uh, description of what is autism from the inside out. So first of all, autism is genetic. It's, this is how we're built, okay? It's developmental. So it starts first thing and it goes throughout our lives, okay? Autism is characterized by a higher level of synaptic connectivity. What the heck does that mean? So our brains make connections and those connections are called synapses. And autistic brains have more connections um, than allistic brains um, and, and more inner connections. So there's a, there's a picture on um, that you can find if you do a Google search for um, Temple Grandin's MRI, there's an image of her MRI compared to uh, an allistic person's MRI and Temple Grandin's, um, Temple Grandin is a, a famous uh, autistic person. Um, and and her, her MRI shows like starbursts and streamers and the allistic MRI shows more like a pretty well-defined river. So, so there's, so much extra activity that happens in the autistic brain because of these higher levels of synaptic connectivity. What happens is because of that synaptic connectivity, we take in a lot of sensory information and we're often sensitive to sensory input of all kinds. So lighting, um, smells, sounds, um, touch, pressure, all of those things. And when we go on information overload, we will melt down or we will shut down. Um, and those are about the body literally getting overloaded. Like your computer is running too many programs. And, you know, once that last program gets opened up, your computer just goes, are you kidding? right? And our nervous systems do that too. Um, it's like having a different operating system. It's all, uh, so, so if you think about Windows versus Linux, right? Or Windows versus Mac, right? Um, lots of people have Windows. Windows is cool. I like Windows, right? But Mac is also cool. Right. And there's no value judgment about, well, okay, for some people there is, but, but the, you know, if you look at it in a neutral way, Windows does neat things, Mac does neat things, but they don't necessarily do the same neat things or neat things in the same way. Right. And that's how autistic brains are different from allistic brains. We also, because of the way we bring in information and the connections that we make, we also have thinking and communication differences. So for example, monotropism is uh, a word that will, probably will be used at least once um, in the rest of the presentations. Um, monotropism is a narrower but deeper focus of interest. So when we talk about autistic special interests, you know, we have, it, it's like a very deep chasm, right? Where our interest goes very deep, but our interests are, are narrower. Polytropism uh, is more of an allistic uh, way of processing information where the interest is broader, but not often as deep which again, doesn't mean that an allistic person can't dive deeply into something, but just that their general tendency is not to go as deep. So we get into a, a groove and we are in it, 
right? But the allistic brain doesn't do that. Um, another thing is language processing, kind of like I talked about earlier. I don't think in language, I think in concepts. And if I'm overloaded, the more I'm overloaded, the more I need time to translate those concepts into actual language. Um, and the literality, the, the literalness that I use um, in my language is a, um, it, it comes from the fact that it's not my first language, um, even though English is my first language. Um, so when I'm confronted with a um, colloquialism that I'm not familiar with, and I don't have enough context to realize that it's a colloquialism, not a literal statement, I will take it literally. And it's very disorienting. Um, and it leads to things like, I'll say something, I'll mean it literally, or I'll have, I'll respond to somebody's question. And everybody around me will laugh because they will be, think that I'm being hilarious. And the reality is I have no idea what I said, but I laugh along with them. I've learned to do that as a masking technique uh, in order to sort of do the mm, social lubrication of just kind of fitting in. Um, so language is a second language literality, um, implied meaning is another thing, which I talked about already. Um, we don't tend to do implied meaning. That doesn't mean we can't learn, but it's not our native sort of way of communicating often. And then um, autism is also highly idiosyncratic. So the, the saying is, if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. It's really important not to make assumptions about what an autistic person should or shouldn't look like. I didn't get, I didn't self-identify until my forties because I'm a highly masking autistic and my idea was Rain Man. <laughs> and so I didn't fit that. And so why would I ever think I was autistic until I learned what it was like from other autistics from the inside out. And then I was like, oh, wait, you do that too? You do that? Wait, there are other people who have these same experiences as me? What are you talking about? This is a thing? This isn't just me being a weirdo, right? So, so autism is highly idiosyncratic. And the theory behind that is that it's, it's, it's how our minds um, create and also prune synaptic connections based on those special interests. Um, but, you know, that's still a, a growing edge of knowledge. The other thing is that autism is a dynamic disability. So our support needs vary based on circumstances and internal resources, as well as basic functioning. Um, so there might be a baseline level of um, difficulty speaking or non-speaking status uh, because of speech apraxia. Um, but there are other people who might have varying access to speech. So they might have um, situational mutism where in one circumstance, they might be able to speak and be uh, fluent and fluid in their speech. And at other times they might be mute and unable to use verbal language, um, spoken language, I should say. So, um, so our support needs vary based on circumstances and internal resources, as well as base function. Now, this goes back to um, one of the questions that was asked earlier, what about the different levels of autism? Um, the levels of autism are required for the medical diagnosis, but they're not actually particularly useful because it doesn't dive deeply enough into um, 
what support needs the person actually has and in what circumstances those pers that person needs those supports. Um, so it's, it's a very broad brush sort of um, response to a much more nuanced conversation. The other thing that, uh, that, that functioning levels and functioning labels, um, the, the, those are problematic for is that um, functioning labels tend to downplay the support needs of people who are highly functioning and downplay the capabilities of people who are low functioning, okay? So when, when you look at, instead of the levels, when you look at support needs and capabilities um, in different areas, you get a much clearer picture of how to support and interact with the person in front of you as well as what they're good at. And you get an opportunity then to interact with that person in the most effective way possible. Um, so it's really important to, to, to tune into the competencies of people who have been labeled low functioning because they might be way more functioning than it appears on the surface. Got my 15 minutes, heads up, thank you. All right, so autistic strengths. And I say your mileage may vary because not all autistics have all of these strengths. And this is also not an exhaustive list. Um, okay, I'll hurry up. I, I get the word that there's lots of great questions. Um, so there's, um, visual and auditory perception, because we tend to take in a lot of data, we tend to be, uh, you know, have a strength in the area of visual and auditory perception. We tend to be honest and direct. Sometimes that's hard for people, but, um, but that can be also a great asset. Um, we make, uh, there's, there are studies that have shown that um, autistic people are better at moral decision-making because we stick to our internal compasses and are less swayed by social forces. Uh, loyalty is another one, pattern recognition. Um, musicality is something that often shows up with autistic people. Um, and there's also, interestingly, an increase in the frequency, pardon the pun, of perfect pitch um, in autistic people. We have focused deep interests, which can allow us to be innovative and creative and, um, you know, in a, uh, lead, lead the charge on new discoveries. Um, many of us have excellent memories um, and many of us have a strong interest in fairness and justice. Um, so again, not an exhaustive list by any stretch, stretch but um, there's, Again, a lot, of, a lot of strengths that come with autism. And then there's autistic culture, okay? Autistic culture is, has evolved over the period of time. Um, let's see, autistic diagnosis started in 1980 with the DSM-3 um, and, by about 10 years later, as, um, as the internet was starting to be a thing, um, autistic people started to find each other. And that's when autistic people started to, to be able to share our experiences and our voices with other autistics. Um, and the, the internet has been a huge facilitator for the development of autistic culture. Um, and so now there's even a journal of autistic culture. So if you wanna check that out, the, um, the link is there on the, the slide, but it's built on the patterns of autistic interests and thought and prioritizes autistic styles of being and communication. And the idea is to you know, embrace fully autistic as 
a valid way of being. Okay, so um, we are now at Q&A time. So I think we have about 10 minutes left. Um, if my Q&A uh, transcribers could send me some questions, I will answer them to the best of my ability. How to navigate talking to parents who are not familiar with any of this information. Um, I start with talking about brain styles and using that horse example, because most of the time, uh, in, even in families, you'll have at least a couple of differences about how people visualize that horse. And I can um, put a link to that exercise um, in, in my follow-up materials. Um, and I also show them the neurodiversity video that I played here, which I'll also include that's available on YouTube um, to get them starting to talk about like, how does your brain work? There's also um, another thing that I'll include on the, the follow-up materials is um, that uh, there's a, a lovely exercise on the neuroclastic website where people can sort of do a drawing visualization of how their brain works. And that can be a really neat exercise to see how, um, you know, how do different people think or function. Um, and it can be a great conversation starter. So, um, so those are a couple of ideas and, um, you know, encourage them to, to start exploring, you know, what, how does your brain do this? How does my brain do this? And, and start breaking down the assumptions that our brains should operate the same. Okay. Another question. I've often thought about the notion of the now debunked cold mother and the ideas of family at the time, but could it be that they were observing neurodivergent parenting in action? speaking here as a self-diagnosed autistic of a, form, of a formally diagnosed child. Yeah, that's entirely possible. Um, I think um, another thing that they were likely looking at is um, misattunement uh, between the parent and the child um, because the parent couldn't really understand what the child needed. And with with prolonged misattunement, there, there is a shutdown that can also happen in the parent because they get worn out by trying to attune and failing to attune. And so then they give up trying. Um, it's a little bit like learned helplessness. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it could very much be neurodivergent parenting in action. I, but I think that's probably less likely um, now, now that I'm thinking it through just because um, it, it's less likely because a neurodivergent parents actually tend to be better attuned to their neurodivergent children. Um, so I think that's probably, it's probably that they were observing the, the shutdown that happens from a, a, you know, an allistic parent who is trying to attune to an autistic child in an allistic way and not succeeding. Um, but I don't know, I, that, that would be interesting to read about. Um, another question, is there a similar term for hyperphantasia for music? No, um, interestingly, hyperphantasia, um, the, all of the words on that spectrum, it's refer to um, internal sensory experiences. So it's not just visual. So, so there could be auditory hyperphantasia or, um, visual hyperphantasia, um, or gustatory hyperphantasia. If you can imagine eating something and you have the full sensory experience of eating that thing, that's another one. So, um, so that's, that's what you would have there. Any other questions? I'm sure there's a billion. Okay, this one's a big one. 
I would love to know your view of how to implement a social model of disability on a large scale in a K-12 schools with autistic children who are not a homogenous group. And what kind of support do you think are appropriate for autistic children? What should the goals be? And similarly, how do we support students in schools who feel they are neurodivergent and want accommodations but parents who refuse to get them tested? Do you have any ideas for conversation starters for parents who are not understanding? Okay, those are two different questions. Thank you. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna take those uh, one sort of one piece at a time. How to implement a social model of disability on a large scale in a K-12 school with autistic children. So the, the question to ask yourself is how can the environment creatively adapt to the child rather than requiring the child to adapt to the environment? And yeah, it's not gonna be homogenous because if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. But what you're gonna, what you're gonna notice is over time, there are going to be themes of adjustments that can be made. Um, and, and one of the themes, interestingly, is a, a adjustability. So for example, in my office here, this is my home office that I'm in, I have um, lighting that I can change from the app on my phone. So if I need to adjust the lighting during one of my therapy sessions with a client, I don't have to get up and fuss with the light switch. I can actually adjust the the color of the lighting, the amount of the lighting, which bulbs light up. It's Philips Hue system. I love it. It's fantastic. Um, and no, I didn't get paid for that. Um, <laughs> but it, it allows me to have the lighting the way that works best for my eyes. Because I can, especially the more tired I get, the more um, visually uh, hypersensitive I get. Um, so, so adjustability is one thing. Another thing is figuring out a way to alternate between uh, students who have opposing needs. So there, you might have a sensory seeking set of students who need um, movement and wiggles and um, you know lots of sound and lots of visual stimulation. And you may have students who um, need less stimulation uh, in those areas. And so um, finding ways to, um, to provide periods of time where each of those students are getting what they need um, and, and alternating. And that's a really, you know, that can be difficult, but when that happens, it allows those students to really flourish. Um, and also individual level um, adjustments. So um, like if one student has uh, auditory hypersensitivity, you know, maybe that student does, um, you know, during the, the, you know, the, the more sensory seeking students time, maybe, maybe that student does step out of the room or, wears headphones during that time so that student doesn't get overwhelmed. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a negotiation for sure, but the more that you challenge yourself to be creative, the more you'll see opportunities. And if you're struggling, hire a consultant, you know, cause we do these kinds of things. And um, we, you know, those of us who are presenting in this conference, I'm sure, you know, and, and others, have great ideas of what to do. So if you're out of ideas, bring in outside help. Don't, don't feel like you need to do it on your own. This is hard. Um, okay. Uh, next is, um, uh, what kinds of support do you think are appropriate for autistic children? Whatever supports they need. <laughs> And I, I realize that that's kind of a flippant statement, but really that's true. Um, uh, the goal should be child-led. And so, um, you know, it's really, really important, you know, especially as the child 
gets older and is able to articulate their goals more, they should absolutely be child led. They should be um, given the opportunity to use their special interests in their learning environment on a regular basis. Uh, because that's going to help them learn the things that they're less interested in because it's engaging their special interest. Um, how do we support students in schools who feel they are neurodivergent and want accommodations, but parents refuse to get them tested? Okay. Um, I think we kind of already talked about that um, and we're at time, so I'm going to need to stop here. Um, but that but again, kind of go back to that idea of brain styles. Um, and also you don't have to have formal accommodations in order to actually give accommodations. Okay. So anyways, I could go on and I, you know, I'm totally capable of that, but um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and wrap up there uh, and do, do review some of the other Q and A's that that uh, we talked about, you're going to get great ideas from the other presenters as well. So anyways, thank you very much for your attendance and your participation. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.